Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Sarah Dor. Um, I'm here on behalf of ISA, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's webinar. Um, we have with us today uh, Mariana Charuntaki and Daniela Herrera. They are editors of the book, Understanding Non-State Actors' Roles in Foreign Policy. And joining them today in discussing the book, we have also Sarah Stroop, uh, Liam Anderson, and Dirwar Sadiq Sawiti. Um, so thank you very much for joining us here today. Um, today's webinar is going to first have the panelists um, uh, present their insights from area studies, and then we will open up the, the floor to questions and discussion. Um, and attendees, you feel free to raise your hand or you can write your questions in the, the chat or in the Q&A. Um, so we will go ahead and get started and I will turn it over to Mariana. Thank you so much. So um, I would like to start my brief discussion of the topic today with a very big thank you to ISA, Sarah, Mary, Joel, and the rest, as well as uh, my colleague uh, Daniela as the book's uh, co-editor. I would also like to thank uh, my dear colleagues uh, for their contributions through real case studies that do have an impact. And what this book does really is that it starts in its preface with a theoretical claim, and then we have the different chapters empirical importance as uh, we bring in different examples from different regions in order to say that different types of non-state actors can act as agents of foreign policy. So today, my focus will be briefly not on my own example, thus chapter, but on the conceptual part. The book offers a, or aspiring to offer a different understanding of what foreign policy is, as foreign policy is undertaken by a broader range of actors and it is practiced differently according to the actorhood at the, under examination. And this is exactly what we are trying to demonstrate uh, through this uh, work. As the preface discussing the book expands the scope of foreign policy analysis and helps to shift our ontological perspective um, on foreign policy. And I think uh, in our case, this is happening through the focus, but also the inclusion of the non-state uh, actors. Uh, this book uh, assigns importance uh, to the contribution of specific types of non-state entities and their actorness within the foreign policy frame and therefore examines how foreign policy making has been really expanded also to include these collectives. And this is not an abstract uh, work, but uh, this work follows up on um, a previous book uh, we did uh, with uh, Daniela in uh, this book, um, I tried to insert a typology of non-state actors and their identification as different kinds that need further examination. And today, to be a little bit more specific, but at the same time, very brief, um, what I'm trying to do is very briefly to just uh, point out how uh, we're trying to create a direct link between foreign policy and non-state actors. So here my argument in the preface is that non-state actors can act as foreign policy makers to different degrees of effectiveness, of course, and are capable of forming alliances based on mutual interest rather than being relegated to the status of uh, institutions of whatever economic orient or mouthpieces or puppets in many other uh, cases, uh, especially when it comes to more informed sort of like entities um, of, uh, of uh, actorhood. Non-state actors are frequently characterized in scholarship as proxies, pawns, uh, or they have been restrained until very recently to institutions of economic orient. Now, I'm glad that we see an expansion of the literature that includes and focusing on many other different types. And here, the view that has been challenged is exactly that, because we're trying to show how possibly we can go beyond such an understanding, which is more stereotypical, I would argue, even though, of course, there are links on the ground with, you know, 
um, there might be cases that they were fit into that. But here, what we are challenging, I think, through these case studies is how really um, the agency has been uh, different and they can act both as facilitators, but also to some cases as decision makers. So they can not only develop policies of their own, but also act as facilitators of foreign policy to the extent that they can be also considered foreign policy actors. However, of course, the level of their success, the scope of the influence and their operational effectiveness can, of course, um, differ, can vary. And uh, since foreign policy includes a wide range of policies and practices, in addition to what I just said to the inclusion of these um, actors, the other, uh, other than the state, the new real, and of course, given the fact that we're talking about the new reality of diffuse borders, challenges, the, the power of thing of contemporary definitions seem again inadequate, inadequate to explain this wide range of foreign policy decisions and maybe what foreign policy is. And here, as well, the preface was trying as well to attempt and insert an updated, if you like, definition of what foreign policy is. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I follow um, Mariana and I will start because I'm, I'm here for giving my very uh, short presentation and ideas about this, uh, this topic, but I'm also uh, um, here for reading what Radka Hoba has uh, prepared. Unfortunately, she is not with us. And she has also written a very interesting chapter on the World Uyghur Congress as an actor of foreign policy. So I will firstly, uh, read uh, not her chapter obviously but what she has prepared and then I will also add uh, after um, this my 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 little presentation um so um the world Uyghur Congress is a non-governmental umbrella organization of Uyghurs in the diaspora advocating for the rights and interests of the Uyghurs in the Chinese province of Xinjiang Although uh, the World Uyghur Congress, Congress is not a formal actor of foreign policy, it influences the foreign policy uh, of international organization and states uh, through advocacy and lobbying. And as such, the Congress can be perceived as an actor of foreign policy whose main effort is to raise awareness of the international public about the situation of the Uyghurs in China and about the human rights violations by the Chinese authorities. In doing so, the Congress lobbies for, by foreign governments and international organizations, organizes protests and demonstrations, testifies before international organizations about the human rights abuses of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, and advocates for boycotts and products made by forced labor in Xinjiang. In the typology of the non-state actors outlined by Charuntaki in the book, the Uyghurs can be understood as uh, of an ethnic group. Uyghurs as an ethnic group can follow one of four basic mechanisms uh, of internationalizing of a domestic ethnic conflict, third-party intervention, irredentism and separatism, refugee movement across borders, or international ethno-terrorism. The Uyghur ethnic diaspora is not unified on the approach to the resolution of the Han Uyghur ethnic conflict in Xinjiang, with approaches ranging from non-violent third-party intervention represented by the Congress to violent methods of international ethno-terrorism represented by the Turkestan Islamic Party, formerly the East Turkestan Islamic Movement or United Revolutionary Front of East Turkestan. The Congress can be viewed as a transnational advocacy network TAN, so from now on, based on Keck and Seeking, the transnational advocacy network includes those actors working internationally on the same issue who are bound together by shared values, a common discourse, a dense exchanges of information and services. Shared values and information exchange are of fundamental importance for the operation of a TAN as they mobilize the actors of the TAN to pursue uh, pressurize and gain leverage of governments and other international actors. The TAN is thus able to frame issues and target international audiences 
to attract the attention of global audience to issues of global importance, mostly related to human rights, environmental issues, rights of indigenous people or women issues. Tan used so-called boomerang effect to advocate for the issues of their interests in the global arena with the ultimate effort to change procedures, policies, and behavior of actors whose behavior the TAN is not able to influence directly. The Congress, as a TAN, uses its mechanism to influence third parties, such as governments, international organizations, glo global public opinion, to exercise pressure on the Chinese government on behalf of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Given the situation of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, there is no doubt the Congress would not be able to influence the situation of Uyghurs in Xinjiang by trying to directly pressure on China to change its behavior towards the Uyghur in the region. The Congress acts as a transnational advocacy network and as an actor of foreign policy on behalf of the Uyghurs in the and in China. To understand the role of the Congress is playing as an actor of foreign policy, the study first briefly discusses the position of Uyghurs as an ethnic group in Xinjiang and in the diaspora. It significantly influences the topics the Congress brings into the international arena on behalf of the Uyghurs living in China. These issues include the rising influence of the Han majority in Xinjiang, suppression of the religious and ethnic identity of the Uyghurs, strict digital surveillance over the Uyghurs in the province, and the infamous Chinese re-education concentration camps. The Congress is probably the most widely recognized and influential umbrella organization of the Uyghurs in the diaspora. However, it's not the only one. Brief attention is paid to other organizations acting on behalf of the Uyghurs abroad to provide a deeper context of the operation of the Congress. The focus of this study lies in the analysis of the Congress and its activities as an actor of foreign policy on behalf Congress activities as an actor of foreign policy. In special attention with the UN, the United States, selected countries of the European Union, Turkey, Japan, and Australia, as these relations demonstrate the role of the Congress play, plays as an actor of uh, foreign relations. And this is the contribution that Radka sent on her behalf as she's not unfortunately here with us today. And I stop here and I will join the discussion again with my uh, own very brief uh, reflection. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, hello. So the title of uh, our chapter, Liam and uh, mine, is uh, Popular Mobilization Forces, the PMF and uh, the Stability of Iraq. The Popular Mobilization Forces is an umbrella network of armed groups in Iraq that was formed in 2014 after the disintegration of the country's regular armed forces in the face of ISIS dramatic onslaught in 2014. Uh, subsequently, the PMF was pivotal to the campaign to defeat ISIS and its status was legally codified, making it a permanent feature of Iraqi security landscape. Here, the PMF was legally codified in the constitution of Iraq, in the Iraqi parliament, but later on, the PMF was also fragmented into many categories, which only some of these categories were legally codified. The PMF is nom nominally under the control of the Iraqi government. In practice, its various constituent groups operate independently of central government control. Uh, as a typology, the PMF belongs in the irregular military and militia groups category of non-state actors. Here talking, discussing about the PMF, we can see the PMF is divided into critical categories. The categories, category one and category two, they are these groups which are under the direct control of the Iraqi government. And we have also the category three, which are more radical and more you know, extremist which is under the direct influence of Iran. Iran, as a threat nar narrative in the region, have tried you know, to portray this breach in the region, in the Middle East, which is you know, via, Syria, via Iraq to go through Syria and Lebanon and you know, with the Hezbollah and Iran. So BMF have become a tool in, 
Iraq in order to control the political, economical, and security landscape inside within the polity of Iraq. Uh, from 2014 to 2017, PMF was one of the main army which were able to defeat ISIS among with uh, the Peshmerga forces of Kurdistan and the Iraqi army plus the coalition forces. Then later on, PMF have estab established his own policy within Iraq as a state and started to you know, organize its political landscape inside Iraq. And also as a matter of security, he started to control uh, over certain areas, which mainly are the disputed territories of Iraq between Baghdad and the Georgia. And they have taken over the control between the border of Iran until Syria. So this have left a huge gap of security between the Georgia and Baghdad. Here what we can see that the PMF is trying to mobilize this area and taking uh, this area under their own parameters of influence, under the influence of Iran. So here what we can understand that uh, the PMF is also an agent of foreign policy of Iran and also uh, Iran, but his own main policy within the policy of Iraq is also a decision maker of foreign policy of Iraq. Because what you can see here, what you have explored in the book and what you have discussed is, what you can see that is that I, uh, PMF after 2017 participated with their political parties in the Iraqi elections. And by participating in the main elections in Iraq in 2018 and in 2021, they were able to receive a certain amount of seats in the, uh, within the Iraqi uh, politic and in the Iraqi parliament. And they received also many ministries. By these ministries, they were a force that were putting pressure on the domestic politic of Iraq and by making their own policy, which are were most, mostly autonomous, and uh, influence the decision making of foreign policy of Iraq. The PMF uh, under the category one and two are under the parameter of most merely autonomous and not under the authority of any other influences. They are uh, playing a role of politic, security and economy in certain, um, certain region in Iraq, mostly which you, you can see that in, for example, in Baghdad, and also in the disputed territories. Under the category three, we have, for example, this group under the control of Faiz Ghaz Ali, we have under, uh, for example, Hadi Al Amri, for example, we have under uh, the leadership of uh, uh, Ghaz Ali, as we said, and these uh, people which are under the direct influence of Iran. We can see that uh, in this territory, they are emerging certain, you know, foreign policy uh, of uh, Iran in this territory. What we can see, for example, now as an example is uh, on in the province of Mosul is the Shangar, which Shangar is also part of the disputed territories. Here in Shangar, the main actor that needed to be present in Shangar are the Iraqi army and the Peshmerga forces of Kurdistan. And they are the only actor which are not present in this area. The only actor which are present in Shangar are the PMF and the PKK, which PKK also belong to the parameter of influence of PMF in this region. In Shangar, they are uh, participating in a regional conflict between Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and the Kyoji, which until today that they are under direct control of Iran in this uh, area, which is uh, Shadal. And uh, the PMF and uh, the PKK, they are in, under direct control of Iran, which are in implementing the direct foreign policy parameters of Iran in Iraq. So what I want, uh, in order to conclude what I wanted to say is that the main argument here of the chapter is that the PMF is an agent, the facilitator of Iran foreign policy in Iraq and also in the other side in their own autonomous version of PMF within the 
political landscape of Iraq, there are determinants and the pol uh, foreign policy decision makers of Iraq. Uh, Liam, I will leave it to you uh, if you want to add uh, a certain notes. Thank you. Okay, let me unmute myself. Um, yeah, I, what I would just um, add to this is that I think the, uh, if you look at the analyses by Western think tanks and policymakers and this sort of stuff of the PMF, it's, it's completely focused on category three groups because it, it feeds into the uh, narrative that's totally dominant in, in, within the foreign policy blob in Washington, which is that Iran is this uh, destabilizing aggressive um, anti-status quo power in the Middle East. And so all the disruption in the Middle East can be um, attributed to Iran and that the PMF category three groups are all just obedient proxies of Iran and do what Iran says. And so therefore they magnify the scale of the threat and so on and so forth. But in fact, if you look at the category three groups, there's, there, there are distinctions among them, kind of important distinctions. And, and I think you can think about it in terms of foreign, foreign policies, um, in terms of their perspective on uh, the US and their perspective on Iran. Some groups are uh, ultimately dependent on Iran and therefore almost entirely loyal to Iran. Other groups operate much more autonomously. So for example, the probably the largest and most powerful category three group is Bader um, organization. And the Bader organization is part of the so-called resistance, which are category three groups that um, conduct attacks against US interests inside Iraq with the goal of getting the US out of there. But Bader itself has never actually conducted any of these attacks. And what Bader has done is it's basically adopted a, a really non-ideological, very pragmatic approach um, to foreign policy and domestic policy in Iraq. So Bada will cooperate with the United States while simultaneously claiming to want the United States out of there. It won't actually join with the other groups in targeting the US forces inside Iraq. And so Bada is a group that, I mean, I'm not defending Bada in any way, but um, that the US can do business with Bada inside Iraq. And if you treat all of these groups as totally dependent on Iran and totally loyal to Iran and don't make these distinctions, then you kind of miss the opportunity um, to cooperate with these groups in a purely transactional, pragmatic way. Uh, and it becomes difficult to know otherwise how you approach these groups because they're not going anywhere. Um, they're kind of embedded in the fabric of Iraqi society. And so the only policy option that appears to have enjoyed support is kind of targeting the leaders. So you designate them as terrorists. And then once they're on the terrorist list, you can kill them. And that's, that's kind of what the US has, has been doing. But um, there's a limit to, to that as a policy in terms of, because uh, it's very disruptive inside Iraq and it's um, kind of unpopular inside Iraq as well because it's seen as a violation of Iraq's sovereignty and so on and so forth. So I guess the, I think what Duwa was saying was that there's, uh, we have groups that are uh, in some respects loyal to Iran and carry out what Iran wants inside Iraq, but these certain groups at least are, are autonomous and pursue their own policies. Uh, inside Iraq, including foreign policies. So uh, we need to be aware, I think, of that distinction, um, which I would say suggests the need for a, a different form of categorization of these groups. Um, and that's, I guess, what I wanted to add. So thank you. Uh, and I guess now it's um, it's up to me to say that, that to add very, very uh, few uh, uh, further reflections on, on the topic before uh, uh, giving the floor to Sarah Strupp, and we're very grateful to Sarah for uh, joining us and also uh, giving feedback, feedbacks on, on the book and on, on the topic. 
Um, well, I, I didn't write any a chapter in this uh, specific book. I will write the conclusions, and uh, but I, I would like to say two things as a edit, co-editor uh, of the, the book and co-editor of the uh, book series, and at the same time as uh, um, <laughs> I have this initiative of I, I um, asked ISA if that was, was possible to organize a webinar on this specific topic, and uh, Sarah and Joel were so kind to accept. And we're very grateful for this. So basically, uh, our idea uh, is to uh, launch uh, um, a debate and to raise awareness on the topic of non-state actors um, and uh, in respect to the uh, in uh, to the uh, in, uh, theories of international relations to analyze various. Uh, influences and impacts they can have in various uh, policy fields and also the the roles that they uh, can play so that uh, in uh, in our first book we uh, um, have uh, focused on the taxonomy so that the point is to obviously to study non-state actors in respect to states obviously in respect to uh, international organizations and in respect to major uh, policy fields. So obviously security has been at the core of our discussions, but also, and also the, the subfields related to security. So defense, humanitarian action, um, conflict resolution, crisis management, but we have also um, uh, uh, tried to, to uh, include other, um, other uh, actors so basically, obviously, the, the usual suspect, uh, um, so the civil society organizations, NGOs, uh, but also, uh, as Liam and Dilworth mentioned, also like terrorist organizations, contractors and other kinds of actors, organized crime, um, um, those actors that are uh, playing different roles. And so the, our, um, uh, our aim is to stimulate a debate on this. Um, it may also be uh, interesting to see how uh, different non-state actors are also combining in uh, within the EU, the European Union. So this is not a, uh, our main focus, let's say, but the European Union or the United Nations have been uh, interesting um, contexts in which non-state actors have interacted and also they have been at the core uh, of different policies. And uh, so how they are uh, also um, playing a role in the uh, emerging trends that have been uh, analyzed uh, in this, uh, um, this last uh, decade and especially in these last years uh, from international relations scholars. Uh, in respect to major crises, either obviously the um, uh, the pandemic or financial crisis before and and war, and also the uh, the developments that the global system will have in in the near future. Um, so this is basically uh, what we would like to do. Uh, so we are we are obviously open to um, reflections that are coming from various scholars of various backgrounds, and really look forward to uh, keeping touch, keeping in touch with all proposals that may be interesting, also to expand our reflections, also to expand our uh, uh, debates, and also to participate to uh, to further debates on on this topic. And we believe that ISA. Uh, is uh, the ideal context in which this can happen, given that um, the, the, the interest towards non-state actors in the, all uh, annual conferences have always been quite uh, developed. So uh, again, we're grateful for this opportunity and we we'll now look forward to um, Sarah Struff for uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Daniela and Mariana for the invitation to be here um, and to Springer for this wonderful series uh, and for ISA uh, for hosting this great event. Um, I come to this discussion as a scholar of non-governmental organizations, a particular type of non-state actor, and really welcome the opportunity to think about other non-state actors who use different strategies, including violence, um, which is more rare uh, in the NGO sphere, um, or uh, 
this transnational activity in governance across various spheres. Um, it's really exciting to get outside of the, the specific NGO conversation and think in greater terms about non-state actors as a, as a category, as a, as a big umbrella type, um, and what it is that we can learn about them. Daniela sent me a copy of the prior book in the series, uh, the 2022 book, Mapping Non-State Actors in International Relations. And so in my few minutes, I'll restrict my comments uh, largely to that volume uh, with the hope that uh, those comments might inform additional contributions to this series, including the works in progress um, described by uh, the other members of the panel, and, um, and perhaps might inspire some of you here in our audience today uh, to think about uh, your own work in, in this space. One of the things that I really appreciate about this series, um, both about this more recent work um, that Diwar and Liam and others are contributing to, as well as the, the first volume, is uh, the scope of the work. Um, and I say scope in a couple of different ways. First is uh, the various theoretical frameworks that are used to understand non-state actors. Um, we need to use every tool in the toolbox here to think about how to conceptualize uh, actors that are very influential in global politics, um, but that have not traditionally been the focus of um, most of the research in IR. And so in the Mapping Non-State Actors volume, uh, there is treatment from the English school, from Marxism, from mainstream IR theories like realism, liberalism, and constructivism. And uh, that, that um, I would say that that's a welcome eclecticism, right, of thinking about lots of different theories and how they understand non-state actors. The scope of the different actors uh, that are explored in the series is also really impressive, from ethnic groups to militias to the PLO to the Kurdistan regional government. Um, this is exactly the sort of kind of cross fertilization across different world regions and different types of actors um, that will yield new insights on non state actors. So, for those of you who don't know about these, uh, this series and, and the different volumes, I highly encourage you um, to uh, map, not, to, to read the mapping non-state actors volume, and I myself am really excited to, to see the contributions to this most recent work as well. In the interest of advancing the discussion, um, I'll offer, uh, let's say, four uh, points uh, that I think can help us uh, advance in our thinking about this and, and where I think that uh, the series and the contributors are uh, well placed to make contributions. So the first is um, I, I'm, I'm a little challenged by the idea that international relations doesn't pay enough attention to non-state actors. Um, I think in the mapping non-state actors volume, um, my caution here is mostly that I think that there's there's a danger of, of being a, of setting up a bit of a straw man here that um, not enough people study non-state actors. I do think that. Um, over the many decades of our field throughout the 20th century, states were um, definitely the center of attention. But at least um, since my professional career has started, um, I started graduate school in September 2001. And within my second week of graduate school, uh, there was a sea change in the way that people were talking about international relations because of in the United States in particular, um, perhaps the United States is a bit behind the curve on this, which I'll concede. Um, but attention to non-state actors, I think since uh, September 2001 uh, in the United States and beyond has been really substantial. So while I agree that um, when Jocelyn and Wallace, when Tarot when Jackson were writing, the state was firmly at the center of international relations, I think that we, there's been some great work done to advance the scope of our understanding of who plays a role in global politics. Um, the literatures that I would cite as really important here are um, works on global governance, uh, fairly mainstream works, whether that's um, Finnamore or Weiss, um, really expansive conceptions of power and authority. Um, Barnett and Duval's uh, contribution from several decades ago is really noteworthy here. Um, the practice turn in IR uh, for NGO scholars, Newman and Sending's work, uh, their 2010 work on global governing the global policy. Um, has been really important. 
um, Aisha Zarakol's volume on hierarchy in global governance, Jessica Green on private authority. Um, I think that there's a lot of places um, that we could go to to understand advances in the study of non-state actors. And um, this might be my own personal bias or interest, but I, I think I was particularly hungry for more attention to power and authority. That if we're going to move beyond the state as an actor and think about lots of different types of actors that might influence uh, local and global politics, that um, we might think more about who has what resources, be those material, ideational, um, be those deference from various audiences. Um, and so I'd really encourage uh, the series editors and contributors to think about uh, the power and authority that their actors have. Um, who are they speaking to? Which people, which areas, which issues do they seek to govern? Um, while uh, the panel was ongoing, I actually reached back on my book bookshelf. Um, one of the books that's been a ready reference for me is Hall and Bierstecker's 2000 two volume on um, private authority in global governance. And uh, they have a, a typology of private authority, market authority, moral authority, and illicit authority. And I'm not sure that it's a satisfying typology, but it might be an interesting um, foil or starting point for pushing on that discussion of the different forms of authority that non-state actors have. So um, point one is uh, inviting um, more attention to power and authority, which I think is where some of the most interesting work on non-state actors has been done. Um, second comment, um, for our members of the audience, I strongly encourage you to uh, look at the first chapter in the 22, uh, 22 volume on conceptualizing non-state actors. Um, Table 1-1 seeks to uh, offer a typology of non-state actors, and the different dimensions are the mode of operation and the goals of the non-state actors. The goals are differentiated by uh, preserving the status quo, gradual change, and radical change, and then the mode of operations, um, I think we might also refer to those maybe as strategies, uh, violence, conventional power, and diplomacy. Um, this table is a really provocative for thinking about how we organize all of these different types of non-state actors and think about them in relation to one another. I thought that um, consideration of the degree of change relative to the status quo is, is a really interesting way of organizing global actors. And in the interest of kind of pushing that even further, um, I would say there are not only some non-state actors who are anti-status quo, there are some state actors who are anti-status quo, right? And we might think about this as even more expansive than just understanding non-state actors, that there's a, a, there's a dominant um, power structure and a set of normative ideas that organize global politics and that there might be lots of non-state actors that push back against those and some state actors as well. Um, I would also encourage uh, maybe some thinking about the way that actors might travel among those different categories, that the goals of actors can change over time. Um, so I know some NGOs have moved um, from being more to less radical over time, thinking of perhaps Friends of the Earth or the Sierra Club in the United States. Um, so I do think that that uh, positioning in relation to the status quo is, is a really provocative way of thinking about um, what the fundamental goals of actors are. I think I was left wanting a little bit more about why um, the three modes of operation, violence, power, and diplomacy were separated in the way that they were. Um, why is Oxfam a radical change NGO, for example? Um, Oxfam has changed substantially in their goals, I would say, relative to the status quo. Um, and Oxfam is put in a category of, of uh, states to be, which I think overstates their governance goals in terms of what it is that they're trying to do. So I understand that this is an initial typology, that um, there's so much work to be done here. Um, and I think uh, these are not unanswerable questions, but I'm just hungry for more here, right? Wanting to know more about um, why those modes are separated the way that they are, that there are NGOs that use violence like Sea Shepherd, um, uh, Meta Elstrup San Giovanni's work here is is really valuable. Um, 
And you could have different strategies like diplomacy and regular power that are, they're not mutually exclusive, they're used by the same group. Um, so just really wanting to know much more about kind of how those modes are separated and, and how they exist and maybe how certain actors might use multiple modes or strategies. Um, third big comment is maybe um, encouraging the, the series contributors to um, go even further on, on thinking about the centrality of the state in this analysis. The promise of this series seems to be uh, rejecting the state centrism of IR, which is fantastic. Um, but I'll, some of the uh, ways in which the analysis is built in the mapping non-state actors volume seems to still put the states at the center. Um, so for example, um, in the introductory chapter, uh, the agency of non-state actors is related to their ability to exert influence on states' foreign policies and to be influenced by state actors or structures. Um, this uh, claim on page five of that volume seems to put states as the center. That seems to suggest that the power of non-state actors is dependent on their relations to states. And that may be true for some non-state actors, but not necessarily for all, and does seem to undermine a bit uh, the, the, the project of trying to move beyond uh, the focus uh, of the state. I think my final question relates to the um, volume uh, underway and um, th this discussion of foreign policy. And I, I think I'd love to just hear more from our panelists and, um, and perhaps from our audience members as well about uh, what it means to talk about foreign policy when the policy is is not being made by states, right? Um, how well do our existing theories of foreign policy analysis travel to our understanding of the interactions between non-state actors and non-state actors, right? Or between states and non-state actors? Um, the, is Are we trying, for example, to see which actors are good at kind of um, taking on particular attributes of sovereignty, right? Are they acting as states to be? Are they acting as if they are states? Or are they doing something entirely different that doesn't really resemble foreign policy at all, but is still really influential on what other actors are doing? Um, if the if the focus of this mo most recent uh, volume is on foreign policy, knowing whether foreign policy analysis is the framework for understanding the interaction of these non state actors, I think would really help us um, understand how uh, how critical a foreign policy analysis, uh, this approach is, um, and whether we need to think of non state actors influence in an entirely separate way. Again, um, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to offer these comments. Um, any criticism contained therein is entirely in the service of advancing this great series. Um, and I really appreciate the, the opportunity to be a part of the conversation. Yeah, thank you very much, Sarah, for uh, providing your feedback, which, which were absolutely very, very useful for advancing our debates and also to develop the series uh, and our reflections. Uh, well, I uh, renew that it's, it's possible to uh, type uh, questions or comments in, in the chat. I don't see nothing yet. So uh, in the meantime, uh, probably uh, uh, the other panelists would like to add something. For example, Mariana, that um, Sarah was uh, um, discussing the, the table one <laughs> in the first chapter that was yeah. actually that you have prepared. Maybe you can react to it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, very briefly, thanks uh, for uh, for the feedback. I, very briefly, I mean, uh, obviously it's interconnected what we did in the previous uh, book as well. But I will try anyway to summarize all of my sort of like responses um, very briefly um, into the following. So um, I will start a little bit about uh, the uh, non-existence, existence of uh, the different sort of actors in the international relations system. Uh, obviously, nowadays, uh, as it is uh, the case uh, with the states, there is inter interdependence. There is no. Um, there are obviously more sort of powerful states, less powerful states. But in the end, I think international politics they demonstrate that interdependence, even among state entities, 
is there. The fact that uh, we are focusing and we are um, uh, abstractedly, if you like, excluding and we just put under the lenses the non-state actor is by no means obviously indicate that um, this sort of actorness is not included in this holistic approach that we are trying to pursue. And when we are talking about the holistic approach, it means that um, what we are trying, and I think what I try to do with this chapter is just like to uh, mostly focus on the fact and stress the fact, which was not, I think, very clear throughout all the different sort of like um, strands, um, theories, and there are strands that we have sort of gone through within the IR discipline that necessarily they are doing it in the same way because obviously they can only respond to certain questions and this is what they have been meant for and it's fine. But the fact that uh, we have um, stress on the sort of non-state actors in order to be able and analyze them with on their own sort of right, it doesn't mean at the same time that we don't recognize that all these, meaning what the um, structures, ideational or material, the states and the non-states, they don't coexist simultaneously in the international relations system. So the fact that in the first place we acknowledge this and obviously uh, as uh, you know, you pinpoint it um, through the sort of quote, the point is that to show this sort of interactive relationship uh, does not mean that we exclude either or uh, as most uh, many of the IR theories, they have tried to do so. And this is what we are bringing up basically is I think this sort of like um, reductionist and in inverted commas approach where we have this either or approaches within the deep because obviously different theories are based on specific premises. So it's sort of like a very fixed box, but A leads sort of like to, to B or different and specific sort of questions are being um, uh, addressed. And here it is a different sort of like approach to try and maybe say within, and but then we zoom out and we talk about like the more sort of the ground theory uh, thing that we're trying to say that basically all these different actors and uh, structures can coexist easily without favoring a priori either or. The fact that we're doing a book on non-state actors it doesn't mean that we neglect the primacy of the state because obviously uh, you, dis you, you refer to this interactive relationship that um, it has been uh, stressed, but in order to be able and analyze something, we have to put it under the, um, under the microscope. So this is uh, purely like in terms of practicality, uh, uh, what we try to do, but overall, I think it's very clear that the focus is on the bigger picture. Um, now, when it comes to this uh, table, um, this table has nothing to do with the typology itself. The typology is a completely different thing. Uh, these types that they have been inserted, uh, they are uh, recognized and identified um, as it is the case with the typology in itself by the nature of uh, these actors. And to be honest, this table is coming in order to say that what the current so far literature has been doing, and I'm not talking about the literature on a specific, if you like, um, uh, type, because uh, we discuss about global, global governance and so forth, that it's not, it's narrowing down, obviously, there, we're talking about a specific field, but if we try to maybe zoom out and see the bigger sort of like picture, um, what I was trying to say is that all these maybe different criteria according to each until recently without calling it typology, um, the current literature was doing, it was really to try and say, ah, violence, ha, ah, B, ha, ah, C. So the modus of, of operandi, as you mentioned, in one column, or the objectives, they were primarily the criteria based on which this different understanding of the non-state actors were happening. But I try to show through this table that look, we can have commonalities, they can have common objectives, they have come, they can have common models of operandis, all these different non-state entities. So which is basically the criterion based on which we can divide them, if all these can be common. So in an antithesis, um, I try to raise this in order to say, hey, yes, this can run simultaneously. Therefore, this might not be the criteria on the basis which we can divide the non-state actors, but 
uh, their nature. That's why we have the categories that we mentioned. We try now also to show um, how this can act as agents of foreign policy. Of course, it cannot be that all non-state actors can act as agents of foreign policy. Of course, it's not that all states can pursue certain policies that maybe we can argue in cases A or B. In CND, is not happening. The same with the non-state entities. So what does this mean? Um, I think it means that uh, in maybe our observation, we can understand at least that when even something is a case, but it is a case which has importance, has impact, affects international politics, not a minor case, but as a major one, uh, this can be maybe enough in order to actually be brought in, analyzed, and maybe make this understanding that, well, these regional examples can inform this theory and maybe to some extent they can, yes, constitute a revolution in these traditional approaches, but we have good use to it. Um, and obviously this is the case because this was how politics, foreign policy and so forth, were running so far. Uh, but this does not necessarily mean, and we, we shouldn't be, I think, preserved and, you know, like, um, sensitive towards that, that this can and might be able to change given how changing now the world is becoming. A last bit, because I don't want to take the time for the rest of the contributors here, my colleagues, I would like to say that when we are trying to do such a thing, and when it comes the moment that, yes, this can sound revolutionary to what is given, it doesn't mean that we are struggling or we are aiming at the deconstruction of what we are from all of what it has been given through the current literature. On the contrary, on the basis of that, because every single bit has its own importance, we are building further how, not through the construction, but how can we add even more? Some things might need to change completely, okay, but we cannot throw everything out. I will give you only one example because we referred to the current book and uh, we talked about the foreign policy analysis. Well, I was, uh, through my through the through the case of the Kurdistan region in Iraq, for example, and through a different examples that I try to in in a different chapter to sort of like prove, and I think if we are able to say that there is there are non-state actors that can act as agents of foreign policy, then if we go back to three to these three levels of analysis, then it means then when it comes to the state level, this very easily could be also informed and include the non-state level as well. Because the other two, maybe they are applicable in both of these cases of these actors that we are talking about. So what is the problem with that? We inform it even more. We don't have to deconstruct it. But in this case, I think uh, we have to maybe think deeper and see if something can be included rather than, you know, demolished vis-a-vis. Uh, the theory. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariana. Actually, we have three minutes left already. And I see there's a, a, a question in a, in the chat, a question by Carl Sonter on uh, epistemic communities, yeah, uh, creating greater integration or uh, our popularist movements. Um, maybe, uh, Liam or Dirwad, you want to reply, or I do, but you first. Um. Sure, I'm not, not really an expert on epistemic communities, but um, I, I mean, I guess I would, there's a, for me, a distinction between um, actors, non-state actors willing to use violence and those who don't use violence as their strategy, as if you will. And I guess in my mind, I would say epistemic communities um, are almost by definition non-violent. Uh, I can't think of an epistemic community that, that employs violence um, and so it, I guess it kind of depends on on uh, the definition of power and and you know your ability to get your to change the status quo or preserve the status quo or whatever and, and the strategy of violence used to do that and I, I, I guess I would tend to associate more power and more influence with those non-state actors that are capable of and prepared to de deploy violence so I, I uh, it's not quite, I'm not quite addressing the question because the question was about populism, right? Was, can you reread the question, Daniela? Okay, I've read it. 
popular yeah, as well. Yeah, I'm just copying, uh, copying and paste, you know, the, the link to the to the book series because someone else also asked me, are the Arab Islamic communities creating greater integration or the international system over time or are popularist movements gaining the upper hand? Yeah, I, it's the person who submitted the question maybe can give us a sense of popularist movements, exactly what, what is intended with that phrase. Is the person who wrote the question still with us? Yeah, they they are. I can um, unmute Carl, who asked okay. the question, and let's see if he, he wants to chime in. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I think, yeah, let's let's stick with Carl, and then we'll move to Sarah. Thank you, Liam. I, I appreciate your uh, feedback on this. When I think of populist movements, I'm thinking of, uh, for example, non-state actors that are uh, projecting possibly uh, incorrect information that contradicts the scientific community. Um, okay. I'm talking about uh, political movements that don't appear to be looking at empirical evidence because the basis of an epistemic community is to create a new paradigm. Um, the best example would be uh, Keynes' theories of economics in the 1930s and how it changed uh, the nature of government interaction with the economy and the political structure. Um, Mainly, I'm trying to see if epistemic communities over time will create a more peaceful environment and create greater international organization. And it appears now that there are individual actors, non-state actors that are trying to disrupt that process. Is this helping to clarify? Yeah, that, that does make it uh, a lot clearer. So, I mean, I guess the obvious example would be on climate change or something like that, right? Exactly, exactly. I mean, it appears that there's uh, individual non-state actors are having a greater impact on this than states themselves. Am I? Like... Yeah, and I think some of this is, again, if we think about it, and Sarah mentioned this, and I think it's a really important point to think about the, the kind of it from a perspective of power and the power uh, comes in a variety of forms and basically the non-state actors are empowered by changes in in media distribution and access to media and social media you know all of these things you can get your own audience by being provocative on youtube and earn millions of dollars and whatever so it's a form of i don't know quite what the term would be for that sort of power but essentially the the social media empowers um non-states essentially and and it's really um through that that that, that the ep or the conclusions of an epistemic community about climate change for example are being challenged because if all i ever see is stuff telling me this is all a hoax then you know that's what i believe so uh, i think it's a fascinating question um which is a way to avoid <laughs> probably not having not having a specific answer to it but uh I, I'd never really th thought about it as kind of uh, global expertise up against populism, but I, I think that's a really interesting kind of way to think about it. Thank you, thank you. I my goal always is peaceful resolution to conflicts, and you know I, I think that international relations as a study, you know, is really critical to 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 that policy goal, and. Um, I suppose in you're you're right. You're right on the mark, Liam, about social media. I think you know that's really a new a driving force in international relations because of the speed of communications now and the ability for people, uh, individual non-state actors, to uh, sidestep the traditional mechanisms for conveying information. The New York Times, for example, um, or a foreign affairs magazine right and uh it, it's almost i think the the problem is is academic experts are um are being pushed out of the 
global argument. Um, I mean, we're sitting here right now. I love hearing your input because you're at the cutting edge of trying to understand these factors, but I like to try to get these ideas into my students' heads. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I feel like I'm fighting all this um, populist sentiment. You know, it's... Well, and I, I think the marginalization of academia is, I think you're absolutely right in the sense that, I mean, in the end, it's, I would, in, put think tanks in, I mean, some of them are, are more authentic than others, but essentially think tanks that produce reports on various things are, are kind of pretend acad academic, and a lot of them are funded by countries or, or, or you know, to, to put a particular view forward. And so I think it, it goes up to that level as well. And, and you know, a lot of, the, if you look at the think tank, industrial scale think tank in Washington, DC, um, a lot of them are, are pushing arguments and lines and using evidence, you know, and they're taking their funding from various state actors or even non-state actors. And so they, they kind of muddy the waters as well. And they're the ones that appear on um, CNN and Fox and uh, like that, as if they are, you know, the equivalent of an academic expert. I guess I'm sounding bitter about <laughs> academia being marginalized, but um, well, I, I think it's not a matter of being bitter. I, I think it's a matter of that it hurts. Oh, oh, okay. Well, I mean, <laughs> it hurts. It also hurts society. It hurts. It hurts our ability to move to move uh, human progress. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a fundamental question, and I, I think that I, I, that's why I wanted to hear this lecture. Is that I think the non-state actors are becoming critical to this um, this situation. Yeah, thank you, Carl, for contributing, and Liam for, for this interesting uh, dialogue on this very important topic. So I uh, I think that Sarah wanted to uh, to add something. Yeah, I mean, of course, but then we can uh, we can end uh, the seminar with you. So please, Sarah. Um, one of the things that I appreciate about this volume and series is the bringing together of all different types of non-state actors, um, those that um, advocate violence, those that don't advocate violence. I think that the scope is um, really helpful for thinking about the strategies that people uh, adopt. Um, one, one thing that this discussion reminds me of is a, a workshop on transnational social movements that Jackie Smith at the University of Pittsburgh and Melanie Hughes hosted, where they were looking at transnational right-wing NGO networks, um, where the kind of, I think many of the epistemic communities that we think about around vaccines or climate change are um, on the progressive end of the spectrum. Hopefully, um, we think that they are also based in rigorous science, um, but that there is also a transnational network of organizations that are united by religious values, um, by other populist values. And um, I would say that this discussion highlights that perhaps we need as much attention to those uh, organizations, th those networks as and actors as potentially influential. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sarah. So there is actually one last question. Um, so what is the best approach to analyze the foreign policies of non-state actors? Mariana, if you can reply in uh, 30 seconds, if you can. You yeah, I think I already mentioned about the inclusion of um, the non-state level, and then obviously this is something that we are working on. The inclusion of the non-state level in the state level. Uh, yeah, well, uh, three think, levels of analysis. Yeah, this is how I see it. If you ask me. Yeah. Uh, well, um, well, uh, I I was very intrigued by what Sarah just uh, said before about uh, that we need to challenge the state centrism of international relations theory. That is actually something that we uh, need to do. Uh, and uh, in a way, we also just tried also to in, in the first book uh, uh, to to discuss the, the state centrism uh, when we talk about um, uh, non-state actors as agents of uh, change and contestation. Obviously, they can also be um, sometimes uh, agents of power because, especially when we talk about NGOs, as you mentioned. And NGOs are part of the international organization's agenda 
uh, or they are uh, like implementing actors of state uh, uh, policies. Uh, and so this is not just to say that they are agents of state, absolutely, but they may cooperate. Uh, and so there are various forms of cooperation also with states, but they are also mostly uh, engaged in contestation and uh, in producing a change in the, in the global arena. And uh, uh, this is also one of the perspectives that we also plan to, to stress in the series and uh, in the various um, uh, reflections that we will uh, uh, like to, to have. Uh, so yeah, I think it is uh, it's time to 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 end this very interesting webinar. As uh, Anna was asking, also I copied in the the, the link to the Springer website uh, where the, the the series is mentioned, and also the the book, the first book is mentioned, and also the the second book on foreign policy that is in preparation will be posted as well. And also we look forward to. Uh, uh, proposals, book proposals on exp exploring various types of non Sarah for accepting our invitation. Uh, um, also, thanks to all uh, contributors that uh, uh, been able to to join us on behalf of Marianne and me. Also, all grateful to Marianne uh, for uh, um, accepting the, the challenging invitation to uh, work on a, a book series on <laughs> state non state actors. And also very grateful to, to ISA, to Sarah and Joel. So we start with the conversation during our last uh, uh, annual conference in Montreal. And uh, so she, uh, Sarah accepted to, <laughs> to, to give us a chance to discuss this topic. So I, I hope there will be any other follow-up events or any other follow-up activities on this very important topic. So, well, thanks, thanks a lot. Also, thanks to the audience for staying with us until the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And we look forward to the book coming out and to the next discussion. All right. Bye, everybody. Hello. Bye-bye.